The Chinese government is currently committing crimes against humanity in Xinjiang, according to Human Rights Watch and other human rights organizations. The United States Department of State has called it a genocide uh, with widespread detention, torture, and cultural persecution. Um, more people need to know about this. And I think that's why Reeducated is also so important. It really gets the word out and there is really no better portal um, for people to get to know what's going on in Xinjiang. Um, I also want to uh, point out one of our interests at the Duke Human Rights Center at the Franklin Humanities Institute is not only to see human rights far, far away, but look at human rights close to home. And this issue has a special importance for Duke University and the Duke community because of our presence in China through Duke Kunshan University. Um, and I really hope that this is part of a process of asking questions about the um, frame of our engagement uh, as a university community in, in China, and in particular issues around self-censorship and um, human rights in the course of our teaching there. Um, it really is important for us um, as an international community, as a global community, to talk about where we stand on upholding human rights and standing up for values like um, the freedom of the press and freedom of expression. So I'll go quickly to, um, I think Ben, I think you're gonna go first. And um, I just wanna quickly introduce Ben, uh, who writes, Ben writes for the New York Times, The New Yorker, Harper's and other uh, magazines and newspapers. He co-founded and directs the Berlin Writers Workshop and in 2021, he developed and co-wrote this immersive uh, virtual reality documentary, Reeducated. And Sam uh, is an award-winning immersive film director, photographer, and Pulitzer Center grantee, and uh, uh, has also won, they both won awards for Reeducated. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Ben. Thank you. Um, thanks so much to to Duke and to the Human Rights Program and, and all of the co-sponsors of this event, we're really thrilled to be able to talk about our reporting and our film. Um, oh yeah, I'm, I, I'll start by describing, uh, I'm in a room in a basement in Maryland. Um, there's a bookshelf behind me. I'm a man in his mid thirties in a gray shirt. Um, yeah, uh, so, the way this will work is I will start by um, talking about, or Sam, do you want to introduce yourself before I start the presentation or should I just do my, my half? Think, think, go for it. Okay. All right. You, you hang on to, hang on to your introduction for now. Um, so I'm going to start by describing uh, a little bit of my background as a journalist, um, especially with respect to this subject. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some background of, for the, of the region and um, kind of how we came to report this uh, piece. And the piece um, has kind of two, uh, two products. One is a virtual reality film uh, that was published by The New Yorker and that um, premiered at South by Southwest this March. Uh, the other part is a um, an, um, sort of an immersive feature article that lives on the New Yorker's website, um, which draws on a lot of the same material in which I wrote and uh, which was also a collaboration with, um, with Sam. Sam and I both developed this project together. Sam directed the film. Um, I wrote and reported the, the material. And we also worked very closely with Matt Huynh, um, an artist, whose work you'll, you'll see um, if you look at the article or watch the film um, and uh, some other, and John Bernson who did the sound and um, Nick uh, who was our technical director. Uh, so this is a big collaborative effort and um, uh, Sam and I sort of have been working on this project since 2019 and it's great to have it out in the world and be able to talk to you all about it. So. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to attempt to share my screen here. Um, okay, I think I've done that successfully. Uh, if I haven't successfully shared my screen, um, please stop me, but I'm going to proceed assuming that, that everyone can see what I'm, 
what I'm sharing right now. Uh, so my name is Ben Mock. I'm a freelance writer and journalist. I'm based in Berlin. Uh, a lot of my work is long form magazine writing. And um, since 2015, a lot of it has focused on human rights issues, particularly um, issues related to migration and citizenship and statelessness. Um, I kind of started on that track uh, reporting on the border crisis in Europe when more than a million um, asylum seekers came uh, from places like Syria and Afghanistan and North Africa uh, into Germany um, due to war and conflict and, and other issues. And that kind of set me on my track of reporting on uh, various human rights issues, uh, often concerning issues of borders and nationality, which, which this subject um, kind of falls under that heading. Uh, but what brought me to Central Asia, to the border of Kazakhstan, where a lot of our reporting took place for this project, and China, and Western China, was this story that I did for the New York Times Magazine um, about, uh, some of you may be familiar with this, with this concept, this, this giant infrastructure and trade mega project called the Belt and Road Initiative, um, which is a multinational project spearheaded by China, but with, with dozens of partner countries um, that in theory is going to kind of revolutionize trade and industry in, um, well, all over the world, but, but especially it's, it's um, many of the projects that are kind of spearheading this, this, much, this much larger amorphous thing are in, um, are in Asia. And I went to go write about a dry port in the middle of the desert between China and Kazakhstan called Horgos. Uh, and I intended for it to be kind of a labor story um, about what it meant for a relatively small country like Kazakhstan to engage with this relatively, you know, really large country like China and what it meant for the country's economy, for people who lived in this region. Um, and so that's what brought me to this uh, area and the, the story in print was called the trillion dollar nowhere um and as the title probably suggests it took a somewhat skeptical view to some of the some of the um really optimistic um kind of predictions about what this dry port was going to mean for the regional economy and and kind of the bri's hopes in general um this is the dry port that i that i kind of went to tour and um, part of the story is about how this, this region is traditionally, um, traditionally uh, not highly developed in terms of industry. And Xinjiang, this, the largest region in China, um, its westernmost region, which borders Kazakhstan, is also traditionally underdeveloped compared to other parts of China. Um, and so part of this story concerned how these economic interests um, and these, these economic plans for kind of reshaping the region um, actually had these uh, human rights effects and were kind of part of the narrative of, of this uh, crackdown and the rise of this security and prison state that were, that were going up across the border. And that wasn't something that was clearly going to be part of the story when I first on my first trip to Kazakhstan when I reported it, but it became um, kind of central because of how important this this border um, and the activities on either side of it was to the these economic developments. So um, at this border, there's a lot of smuggling, and this is kind of some open air smuggling that's happening. Um, these all the photos for the story were by Andrea Fritzetta, who's a photographer with the Times. Um, there were kind of tourism efforts. Uh, this is actually uh, technically in China in this free trade zone that's right along the border of, of in Horgos between Kazakhstan and China. Um, and so I, I went there and you can see that I was myself kind of the object of some fascination um, for this reporting. Uh, and of course, there's quite a lot of uh, traditional agriculture and, and nomadic pastoralism that still takes place along this border. And historically, the, the border between Xinjiang and China was quite... Um, fluid uh, prior to, uh, you know, let's say the, 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 um, the PRC, let's say in the, in the 30s and 40s. And, and even after, uh, it, was, it was quite common for Kazakhs and Uyghurs to maybe cross over this border as part of their, um, their traditional livelihoods. 
Um, and this was kind of part of the story that I was that I was telling for the times. Um, and a lot of these, uh, a lot of the communities here live right along the border and might not even know exactly where, um, if they live in the mountains, like, like this family did, they might not even know exactly where Xinjiang begins and Kazakhstan ends. Um, they, they may in, in fact kind of have um, cattle that, that graze right up against the border. Um, and that's kind of traditionally how this region was thought of prior to um, kind of the, the uh, calcification, you might say, of this border, uh, which produced several um, waves of refugees, one of the most uh, notable of which was in 1962, um, when a lot of uh, central, a lot of Kazakhs uh, fled China for the Soviet Union. Kazakhstan was then part of the Soviet Union. Um, so that's just some background of this region. Uh, while I was in this part of the world in Jharkhand, there was an extradition trial taking place for a woman who was seeking asylum in Kazakhstan, um, an ethnic Kazakh woman from Xinjiang named Sairagul Stoutbe, who at her trial um, disclosed that she had been an, a Chinese language instructor at a re, what, what I'll say for lack of a better term is a re-education camp in China. And certainly there was news of these camps and this, this a uh, wave of mass internment that was taking place in Xinjiang, but there was very little information um, coming out of the region and particularly coming out of the, the facility, the detention facilities themselves. Um, and I just happened to be reporting the story at the same time that her, her trial ended and I was able to attend. And this this is a, a photo from the, the Times piece that Andrea took, but here's a, a, a photo that, um, just a, a someone I, I knew in the region took, and you can see that I'm in the, in the back there, and this was kind of the rest of the courtroom. And Syrigal was claiming that she needed to uh, receive asylum in Kazakhstan because she and her family were not safe in China and that she believed that she herself was going to be detained. Um, so this was kind of an interesting trial to attend. And um, in the process, I met quite a lot of uh, uh, other activists in Kazakh civil society who were really concerned about what was happening in Xinjiang, um, was concerned about the reports that, that potentially hundreds of thousands or even a million um, Turkic and Muslim minorities in the region were being detained uh, in China um, for, you know, things like wearing a beard or for having WhatsApp downloaded onto their phone or having some religious instruction on their phone. Um, there were stories kind of trickling out. And after attending that trial, I'm, I took several other trips to uh, Kazakhstan um, in the process, interviewing um, dozens of people, many of whom had family members who had disappeared um, both into these uh, deten extrajudicial detention camps and then those who had received long prison sentences as part of the, the kind of normative legal system in China. Um, but again, these prison sentences were extremely punitive and the, the crimes that they were being charged with appeared to be related to just normative religious and cultural practices. So it was clear um, as I was doing this story that um, that actually the real story was this, this human rights crisis in Xinjiang. Um, so yeah, this this was another man I met on, on one of my trips, Nurlan Kaktebek, um, or uh, yeah, I think so. Um, Nurlan features in the in the time in the New Yorker story that I'll that I'll mention um, that I'll mention later. But he also was he was a he was detained in a camp for seven or eight months. Um, I think despite his advanced age and despite the fact that he never really found out what uh, the exact nature of his infraction. Um, and there's something like. 50 people who uh, spent time in these detention centers who have now spoken to journalists like me and uh, many, many other journalists, obviously, too, about um, their experiences in detention. Um, in, on top of which, there are hundreds of people who have stories of family members who have been uh, sent for re-education. And um, here I am with uh, one of the three subjects of the film, Oren Beck, um, on our last trip to Kazakhstan and meeting Orenbeck was, was really significant because um, it was through him that I met um, several other people, uh, including two other men who were detained at the same um, facility at the same time. 
And that's when Sam and I began to talk about the idea of doing a film um, because this was quite a rare um, collection of interviews. These three men who had um, really vivid recollections of their experiences in a very specific detention facility in Tacheng, um, who even intersected with each other and in some cases shared cells, shared classrooms. Um, so this, uh, after, you know, on, on my uh, maybe third reporting trip to, um, to Kazakhstan, um, I began to feel that there was kind of this bigger story here. And, and Sam and I kind of realized that actually virtual reality might be the best medium in which to tell it because um, central to kind of this uh, story and the, the, the logistic difficulties of reporting is that journalists cannot report freely in, in Xinjiang. They can't really get into these camps and they can't freely interview people who have gone through these detention centers. So to have um, the ability to kind of recreate one specific center using eyewitness testimony, using satellite images, um, using uh, stuff that's scraped from the, the Chinese internet, uh, using these different resources to sort of reconstruct these spaces and to have um, these kind of interwoven stories from these three men about what happened to them um, over the course of their detention, which was in some cases just a couple months, in some cases it was almost two years. Um, this was a unique opportunity um, that that Sam and I wanted to bring to a place like the New Yorker. Um, I have some of these a little out of order. This is just to indicate, this was at Syragul's trial, and it's just to indicate the interest from civil society in Kazakhstan in this, um, in this event. Uh, and it, it, since then, many more uh, eyewitnesses have, have come forward and the, the, the information we have about what's happening in Xinjiang is much more robust than it was in 2018. Um, so in December uh, of 2019, um, I went back to Kazakhstan with Sam and with Matt, our artist, in order to conduct um, in order to conduct these interviews. Uh, we, we specifically went to conduct kind of extensive interviews with the three men that I had identified who would be the main subjects of this New Yorker project. But we did close to a dozen other interviews with with other former. Um, former detainees um, who could speak to uh, different experiences in different camps and, and also just different experiences of life in Xinjiang under the kind of new security state that, that began to, um, to kind of show its nature in 2017. Um, and if you read the New Yorker article, you'll, you'll see some of these other stories that don't really fit into this, um, this the, the film, which has a really tight focus on, on the three subjects and, and one particular camp. Um, we went in winter, obviously. Um, around that same time, I published an oral history of um, detention in Xinjiang in a magazine called The Believer um, with illustrations like this that were based on my uh, photographs that I took of subjects. And um, I want to mention that because I think uh, part of the way that I think about um, my work is trying to find a, a form that that suits the content that I'm able to get as a journalist. And um, uh, there's, there's since been a, so much um, tremendous journalistic content about uh, Xinjiang in the New York Times and BuzzFeed. Associated Press, um, Washington Post, uh, but you know when I when I enter a project like this, I'm often thinking about the kinds of things that normal news style reporting fails to capture. And for me, listening to these interviews, sometimes they would go on for several hours um, and and talk in great detail, not just about an experience of detention, but kind of the steady erosion of um, rights and civil liberties in Xinjiang that took place over over years and even decades um, as, you know, the, the state tried to crack down on, you know, at first political dissidents and act, le legitimate acts of, of terrorism, but also increasingly just expressions of Uyghurness particularly, but um, just uh, expressions of religious and cultural identity. And hearing these uh, interviews at length was so powerful and the, the narratives themselves were, you um, had had kind of a weight and a journalistic integrity all their own, especially when you put, you know, let's say two dozen together. 
And so that's what I wanted to do with this oral history. And it was kind of when I started thinking about different different non-fictional forms and different journalistic forms that could um, illuminate different sides of this crisis and describe what's happening in Xinjiang in different ways, um, including in ways that, that, that yeah, like in, in, a, in a New York Times article would be hard to convey because you can't just give thousands of words to someone to tell their story. So uh, this was kind of the, for me, this was kind of part one of this multi-year project that I that I ended up focusing on. Um, it's on the believe online on the believer you can find it by googling the title. Um, and after that, uh, when I started having these conversations with Sam, we talked about, well, wh you know, what, what, what else could we do by by kind of experimenting with form and yeah being able to situate someone in a in a in kind of this three-dimensional space and putting them in in kind of the, the empathy hot seat of sitting inside one of these cells and having the the space and these stories take place all around you um and hearing the voices of the of the the actual former detainees right in your had this this to us had a lot of um, potential for kind of narrative power, in a way that um, just a, a piece of reporting wouldn't. And um, yeah, this is us when we arrived in Kazakhstan, Matt, Sam, and me, um, as we began to embark on on these interviews. And um, you know, we didn't exactly know the the strength of the material that would we would get. Um, and we were we were really pleased that we we did get a you know a, a a, a surfeit, I would say, of of material for for both the film and the and the article that followed it, um, and this is an example of of what an interview might look like, um, where I'm asking questions and we're taking audio recording with the with the purposes of of doing um, of putting this in the film, and and we also ended up. Uh, working with The New Yorker on a radio show slash podcast, a New Yorker radio hour episode that used some of this, um, some of the audio that we didn't use in the film, uh, kind of describing experiences of detention, of forced confessions, of having party cadres live in your house and instruct you on kind of um, changing your life to follow more normative Han um, ethnic Han behaviors and, and abandoning your your kind of cultural objects, your, your religious texts, your wall hangings, your the way you eat, the the your the your prohibited foods, the the fact that you don't smoke or you don't drink, um, these are all kind of varieties of experiences that we got from from the many people that we interviewed. Um, this is another one with the with another of the film's three main subjects, Amanjan. Um, and here's you know as we were sitting in the room, we were asking a lot of very specific questions about the nature of the spaces, and while we were doing that, Matt was sitting in the corner drawing. Um, he was drawing their expressions, their faces, and he was also stepping in to ask specific questions about the layout of the room, the different objects in the room, and this was because we um, took very seriously kind of the 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 journalistic power of these um, this information too, and we wanted to achieve a kind of verisimilitude. Even even in um, an animated film, um, even though it would not be a, a 3D forensic recre recreation of these spaces, we did want it to have um, as much verisimilitude as possible. And so throughout the year of working on this film, I was constantly in touch with the three subjects as we kind of um, would check, show them 3D renderings of the spaces, making sure we had the size accurate and the, the other details of the space accurate, just so that... Um, once we showed them the film, they could say, yes, that was the that was the camp that I was in, which which ultimately was the experience we had. Um, yeah, this is an example of the of the kind of um, diagram we might have one of the detainees. This is a, a sketch of the classroom that I think I think it was Orenbeck made. Um, or we would have them stand up in the room and say, okay, pretend you're in the classroom, describe exactly what's in front of you and, and then slowly turn in a circle and describe what you see as you're turning in the circle. And um, this was necessary because, um, yeah, these were, these were uh, difficult experiences for them and we had to kind of mechanize this process of, of putting them through it. And, and they wanted to participate in this film. They understood that the three subjects understood immediately the importance of, of getting these details right, but we kind of had to come up with a with a very mechanical process for for getting these details. Um, 
so yeah, I, I wanted to close with just a couple of things. I want to leave a lot of time for questions after after Sam's um, after Sam's section, if we can. Uh, I wanted to close by thanking um, all of the Kazakh and Uyghur um, and 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 other uh, people in Kazakhstan who we spoke with and who helped um, who who took quite significant personal risk to make their stories known to the world. Um, and who have who have done that for me many times over over several trips to Kazakhstan, who believe in the importance of um, of illuminating for an international audience uh, the the ongoing human rights crisis in in Xinjiang. Um, so I wanted to, yeah, their 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 risks are are far higher than those of, of foreign journalists who are reporting on this subject, and um, I think it's incumbent on. Um, readers and viewers to pay attention and to uh, do what they can to to validate those those risks that um, that that our subjects have taken. Um, I also just wanted to point out that although Sam's going to talk about the making of the film in, in much more technical detail than I have here, uh, but in addition to the film, there is this um, uh, feature uh, magazine article on on New York on the New Yorker's website that I will just very briefly scroll through for you this was you know we knew that not everyone was going to have a 3d headset not everyone was going to be able to see the film um and we wanted to create an equally ambitious and interesting um piece of journalism text text based ultimately but using a lot of the assets that nick rubin and sam and and that when and i created um so we came up with this that we, working with really brilliant and talented people at the new yorker we came up with a this um, kind of interactive uh, feature that, as I'm scrolling, you'll see has some um, some kind of animated uh, assets that that Matt created for that that Matt and our team created just for the article, um, kind of showing the sort of giving life to some of the the interviews that that you hear about throughout the article, um, and then later, if I can scroll down a little more, we actually sort of use. The assets from the film. So this is kind of a scene from the film that we um, re-envisioned as something that could appear in a browser. Uh, and and you see, there's these little text boxes that use even actual dialogue from the film um, in order to convey uh, kind of some of the same visual information alongside the the article that I wrote. And and there's even there's Sam's photographs uh, later in the article, and there's uh, some music. Um, so this was kind of part of our sort of experimenting with form and finding a way to um, to tell this story in as many ways as possible and to reach as, as wide and diverse an audience as possible. Um, so I'm going to stop there and let Sam introduce himself and do his bit, and then we will answer some questions uh, as long as, as people are around for it. So hi, my name is Sam Wilson. I'm a documentary director and photographer. Um, so I thought, you know, as Ben kind of did with his intro as well, um, that I talk a little bit about my background, what brought me to wanting to use VR as a tool for documentary storytelling over the past several years, and um, then dive a little bit more into the production of, of our film. And you'll have to excuse me a little bit. It's uh, way past my bedtime. So I apologize if I'm a little loopy. Um, so my background, Predominantly is as, as a documentary photographer. I worked for several years in Sub-Saharan Africa, um, uh, several other countries. And over the course of that time as working as a foreign correspondent, I, I basically became really frustrated with photography as a, as a journalistic um, medium to sort of convey these really nuanced stories into either a single image or a series of images. And that's when I sort of stumbled upon this, this new medium of, of virtual reality, which in no way solves the, the sort of entrenched images, the entrenched issues of documentary photography, um, but it does give us sort of a new framework to start thinking about um, storytelling, visual storytelling, journalistic storytelling. So this was the first project that sort of opened up my, my eyes to um, the power of, of what documentary could do within a VR context. This film called We Who Remain, it was the um, first VR 
360 film, uh, character driven film shot in an active war zone. It was a, a collaboration with the New York Times. And I think the, what opened my eyes up with this film was just um, sharing this film with people and seeing their reactions, seeing, seeing how it affected them in a way that I think um, my photography and my film work never really did. And maybe that uh, says something just about, you know, my, my photography and film work, but to me, it says something about this medium itself, how powerful and unique that this medium is in conveying something that you just can't do in other spaces. And I think it's, it's a really scary thing. It's a really exciting thing. Um, and it's something we're just sort of exploring now as a, as a potential communication medium. But it, it, it kind of opened my eyes to thinking about using this in a documentary journalistic context. Um, you know, VR does a few things really, really well. It gives you a sense of presence in a space. It gives you a sense of space itself. It's basically simulating how we experience the world. It's, it's much less of a abstraction, so to speak, than a photograph is or a, you know, text or a film. It really just makes you feel like you're there. It can give you a sense of an opportunity to empathize with the places, spaces, people that are um, you're sort of seeing. Um, so it does some of these certain few things really, really well. And when you can find a story that matches up with these unique abilities, um, I think it's, it's really worth it and meaningful to find projects that do that. So um, this was in 2017. I went on to continue working with other places like National Geographic um, on other VR films last year, I premiered a project that Sundance called After the Fall about After the Fallout about the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster. Again, all of these projects really lended themselves in their subject matter to using VR as a medium. Um, and that brings me to re-educated. Um, so Ben talked about this a little bit, um, but this was a project when we first started discussing this. Um, you know, I, I was keen to learn about Ben's reporting and his research, um, but, and we, we had kind of had discussions about whether there was a way to do something in VR. I, I was really initially very skeptical um, because it didn't sort of fit into that, those, those parameters of what typically makes it worthwhile to um, go through all the effort to do, to do a VR project. And it, it wasn't until through Ben's reporting and his context that we, as he mentioned, we found these three guys who had been in the same space, had overlapping experiences, and had uh, the ability to describe the same um, inaccessible spaces that we realized that not only would this project benefit from being uh, a contribution journalistically, but there was a real uh, immediate reason to use VR to, to tell this story. Um, the space, the space, the place, these environments are as much a character and an important journalistic contribution as are, to me, the testimonies of, of the three, um, the three guys who are featured in this, in this project. Um, this is a, a little trailer for, for the film. So, you know, as Ben mentioned, we started reporting this in 2000, the end of 2019, all the way up until March of um, 2021, where we premiered it at uh, South by Southwest. Um, this was a, a long and sort of difficult project that went through COVID, went through the US presidential election, went through, um, you know, working abroad across multiple countries, which I'll, I can get into a little bit later. Um, and sort of an unprecedented thing for all of us. You know, for me, uh, as an immersive film director, whatever I am these, these days, I'm so, I'm used to being on the ground and fil filming something with a camera, bringing it back, constructing a story. Um, this is entirely made with, with animation, um, which was sort of a, a, a new frontier. So I think that that sort of a new frontier for me personally. So that sort of begs the question of, you know, how do you go from um, situations like this, which, which Ben discussed a little bit, where, you know, we would spend hours and hours, we, you know, dozens of hours of, of interviews with these, in particular, these, these three guys for the film, 
um, how do you go from this, which is just a bunch of audio to that sort of um, very stylized world um, that I, I just shared with you in, in, in the preview trailer there. Um, you know, and as Ben mentioned, it started here. It started with these rigorous questions, these sort of overlapping questions about spaces, about experiences that we were asking separately between all three, um, all three subjects. Um, that would sort of function as the backbone of this of this project. Um, that meticulous reporting that we did allowed us to reconstruct these spaces in a not forensic way, but as a incredibly meticulous as, as we could make it way, um, where we were looking to sort of emulate every detail that we could think of and that we had access to be three between the different testimonies. So everything from how far apart were the beds, which bed did you sleep in? Um, what did the chairs look like? What did the table look like that you were eating on? Where would the table go when you weren't eating? What did the TV look like? What was the brand of the TV? What did the cameras look like? How did you stand during the national anthem when you had to sing it in the morning? Basically every detail that we could manage to track down, we brought into these environments in a very uh, meticulous way that I think makes this a much more meaningful project than um, if it was based on a singular memory or something of the like. Um, once we sort of had those initial constructions and ideas of uh, the spaces based on these overlapping uh, uh, memories, we were able to build pretty sterile three-dimensional models of, of these spaces. Um, which I think I wanted to show this image because it's it it sort of raises a, a really another really important point of why we chose the style and the approach that we did for for the film. Um, there's a lot of really incredible reporting, as Ben mentioned, that does reconstruct some spaces and brings you through different things. But the 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 humanity of what people were going through in in these situations really sometimes can get lost in the presentation of those ideas. And so it was crucial for us to not only find the journalistic backbone of this, but to find a way to have that humanity come through in the visual language that we were using. Um, to do that, we, we found an incredible uh, team of artists, most, most specifically Matt Huynh, um, who basically every single inch of what you're going to see in the film was created by uh, Matt's hand. Um, you know, every texture, every animation, every poster. So you see on the left here, you see the, the floor tiles, you see the posters in the wall, you see the, the, the washes on the, on the wall, you see the beds, then you see the characters. Um, I'll play this one more time. Um, who are, you know, have these sort of, they're called boils, which is a series of individual frames, which um, you can see Matt drawing an individual frame on, on the right here, which basically if you think of like old Disney animations where you see, imagine a guy in like a, you know, a sweaty condensed place somewhere drawing a frame and then turning the page and doing the next one. That's how we made this film. So basically we, we infused humanity and this lyrical language into the project by having this artist, this artist's hand, this artist's mind and heart touch every single inch of, of this world that we were constructing. So we could combine that, that journalistic backbone with this emotive storytelling that gets us closer to these, um, both the environments, but also these testimonies that, that we were given. Um, so, that was, you know, an incredible amount of work, both for Matt, but, but our entire team. You know, sometimes we had scenes with hundreds of characters in them, which means that they had to literally be, everybody had to be drawn by hand and uh, oriented, again, based on the testimony, based on all of the, um, you know, reporting that we were doing, then sort of fusing those two together to, go from something like this, where we would put all these mock-ups together based on the reporting to then create what's essentially a, a three-dimensional diorama um, where we would take these flat um, sort of planes 
of, of Matt's art and orient them around the camera um, so that everything perspectively had to be uh, uh, specifically drawn. And I, I, I can go into more detail about this if anyone's interested, but it was, it was really hard to figure out and very, very time consuming. Um, here's another image of that where on the right, you can kind of see the final um, display. And on the left, you can see how they were sort of constructed of these flat postcards that were sort of sitting around the camera. And, and again, all of this sort of laying on top of, it's like this meta layer on top of the foundation of journalism that we had to do to get to the point to construct these, construct these scenes. Um, another really important part of this project was the sound. Um, we used a really special sound technique called ambisonic audio, which basically allows us to place sounds in 3D space around the viewer in VR. Um, it doesn't sound like a, a, a this huge thing, but it's actually, again, it's all about bringing the, the viewer back into the experience, immersing them further into um, just being immersed in, in, in the world. And these, these audio techniques allowed us to do that. Besides the, um, uh, the interview, which you can hear in the background throughout the entire film, um, Every other sound had to be the sound environments, which were created by John Brunson, who is this incredible sound artist and was doing on location uh, uh, kind of creations of, of these sounds as well. Um, so, you know, throughout this process, again, um, it was a constant balance between creating these, these, these worlds um, and the journalism. And that was something, um, you know, from the beginning and, and every step of the way, we had to make sure we were checking these little details that that took this, you know, sort of another step. So, um, you know, on the left here, one way that we would do this is we would be in constant touch. Ben would be in constant touch with um, our three subjects, Oren Beck, Amajan, Yerbaket. Um, and, you know, little details like how are you standing during the national anthem, right? I mean, th these don't seem important, but they actually are really important if someone who actually has a context for this were to look at it, this, this stuff creates a, a much more uh, realistic feeling. So, or on the, on the right, you have, um, you know, this is an image from the transfer scene and, you know, to try to figure out were you kneeling, were you squatting, did you have bags in your, over your heads? You know, when you were in the hallway, did they put them on when you were outside? Were you handcuffed together just at your ankles or the, you know, so we would basically send these images to our subjects and have them, you know, using pictures, uh, tell us, you know, which of these details was, was most accurate or if none of them were, try to find a, a description of something that would be more accurate. And we could go across the three subjects to do this. Um, so going from, you know, going from that to eventually here's again, a, a, a final render of, of this, of this transfer scene where you can see hundreds, you know, sort of a culmination of a lot of the things I'm talking about where you have hundreds of different characters on the screen, which are all informed by our, our reporting, um, uh, the three testimonies of, of the uh, three men who went through this experience, in addition to a series of satellite images over a course of several years, other uh, leaked document, other leaked uh, images and videos um, that all sort of come together to inform this, this um, experience. And to me, this is, you know, one of the most uh, sort of haunting and harrowing moments of 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 the of the film where you have um, you know the especially with Amajan's audio in this part, which um, I'd encourage you to go go listen to if you have a chance. Um, again, uh, you know this. <laughs> as I said, we, we had to do this during COVID, which was obviously not anticipated. That allowed us a little bit of extra time, but it also meant um, we had to figure out a way to work collaboratively on something that was very new to all of us um, across uh, several different countries in Kazakhstan, not several different, several different time zones, Kazakhstan, Tunisia, Germany, New York, California, um, and that, you know, was a learning curve, but I think uh, it, it was sort of something that's only possible right now. And, and we were very lucky that we did the reporting before COVID hit um, and that we could do the rest of this 
outside of that. So um, the last thing I'll talk about here, and this is something that Ben touched on as well, but um, you know, VR is not an innately accessible medium. Not everybody has a headset and that's a problem in terms of wanting to work on a story that has impact and has reach. Um, so this was something we were thinking about from the start of this project that was really important to us. Um, and we, we basically thought of a lot of different strategies to try to amend that. So things, one thing which I'm sure Ben can talk a little bit more about, but we released the film, for instance, in Kazakh first language um, on YouTube as well, which is, I think, the only time the New Yorkers ever released something entirely in Kazakh. Um, so the project's entirely free and available on YouTube. Um, you know, it's in fancy festivals and all these other places, but we wanted it to be on the most accessible platform. So you can actually use it with your phone and look at it. You can use it in a browser. Um, and you can also have the, the really high-end headset experience. Um, but this is all, all of that is still limiting in that VR is really a, a medium that's not good at doing everything. And as Ben mentioned before, um, you know, it was important for us to find a way to bring elements of this VR um, world that we were building into something else. So, um, you know, for instance, VR is not good at conveying a whole bunch of really dense information to you. This was something we struggled with throughout the film of, of having the audio um, compete with just people experiencing being in the world. And so we had to pare down the amount of information in the film, make it much more about the experience and the, the testimony overall. But to work as a companion to that, we, we knew that we would have Ben's incredible writing and reporting to which, which does really lend itself to explaining the breadth of what's going on in Xinjiang and all of these other people who, who we did interviews with and further details about these stories, that just doesn't lend itself to VR. So in a sense, these two work together to give you a fuller, um, a fuller idea of that. And again, it was, you know, we worked really hard to find innovative ways to use um, you know, scroll-based browser 360 video stuff to make this as accessible and interesting um, as possible while also expanding on the reporting that we were doing in the um, 360 film itself. Um, so with that, uh, I, think, I think that's it. I'll stop sharing my screen. Great, Emily, am I good to start the Q&A? Yes. Great, thank you. Um, that was amazing. And I uh, really appreciate going into both the kind of nuts and bolts of, of not only how the reporting was done, but how the, the film uh, was made. Um, I'm gonna start with a couple of questions. Um, and then we have a bunch of questions in the queue for, um, from our audience. Um, one thing about, now this is kind of a polemical or kind of a, a little bit of a devil's advocate question, but um, in, you know, in some ways you're making a movie. Um, so you're recreating sound, you're recreating um, the place, you're, 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 you're pulling together these different elements to reflect um, the, and then you're including the reporting in that but it's not um, a documentary where you are actually filming the place and you're actually recording the sound. And I wonder if you, maybe Sam and then uh, Ben could kind of comment on that. Like it's, there has been this tradition of documentary being the real, real, but this is not the real, real. This is the real, but also augmented. So I just wonder, wondered if you could talk about that a little bit. Uh, I mean, I, I guess I would maybe take issue with your definition of, of documentary and that, that blurring of, of that boundary. I think if you look at even some of the most famous documentary filmmakers, someone like Werner Herzog, who often like uh, will stage some of the stuff that, that are part of his films, 
um, you know, or even if you're going to go a little further and look at, you know, how the, you know, often documentaries are constructions of, of the creators of those things to begin with. I think I wouldn't say that what we made is not a documentary. I would say that it's, um, it's definitely a documentary and it's using innovative um, and sort of resourceful ways to do as much as we could with the things that we had, you know, even, even someone like Errol Morris, um, who's another incredibly, you know, renowned documentarian, he will use interviews and then basically use archival footage or reconstructions of things for the entire thing. Now, the fact that we used animation instead of filming reenactments, I don't really see a distinction between that. Um, so, so yeah, I would, uh, that's how I would answer that. Ben, I don't, I don't know if you have any thoughts. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I agree with that. But at the same time, um, maybe uh, to, to, I, I, I think your, your question does, does make a good point, which is our project conveys a certain kind of information um, and a certain kind of truth. And that truth is rooted in eyewitness testimony. And I believe that that is um, a vital kind of information. And, and it's, it's what I've kind of staked my, my, uh, most of my writing on, but certainly my writing on, on Xinjiang is rooted in collecting um, reliable, consistent, and cross-corroborating eyewitness testimony. Um, but that's only one kind of information. There's also, I mean, we use other kind of information, especially in the, um, in the article, satellite images, um, Chinese government documents, um, Chinese state media reports, uh, textbooks, um, court doc, court records. These are other kinds of information. Um, and in, in film too, in documentary too, there's different kinds of information. And there are documentaries on Xinjiang that involve people taking cameras into China and, and recording interviews undercover with people. And that is an option that, that some journalists have, have gone with in order to get information about Xinjiang out into the world. Um, I have a lot of concerns about that kind of reporting. I think it unnecessarily, or you know, you can arguably say it's necessary, but it, it definitely endangers the people that who are unwitting participants in your project. Um, and I think it does so without consent. And I think um, you need to have a really, really good reason to uh, to do something like that. And it has to contain information that simply can't be accessed any other way. Um, and this isn't to like pick on those filmmakers because I think everyone, you know, has to make their own um, judgment calls, I guess, and in terms of what's what's acceptable to them. But um, I'm I'm constantly thinking about the the repercussions and and the safety of the subjects who speak to us. And um, you know, when an interviewer when an interviewee tells me that I they don't want me to use their name or they don't want me to use their material, um, I just don't do it. Uh, because I think that the risks are very high and the risks inside China are much higher even than the risks in Kazakhstan, which have gotten a lot more significant since I started reporting in the region in 2018. There has been a, a severe crackdown on discussions of this kind of stuff, human rights in China, I mean. Um, but this is just to say that it's important to understand our project within the context of a much larger body of work that many journalists and human rights uh, activists have brought to bear on what's happening in Xinjiang. And I would not want our film to be the only kind of information that's out there, but I do think it it fulfills a particular need. And I think the kind of um, focus and uh, the, the kind of like particular attention we give to eyewitness testimony is special in, in, this, in this larger genre of, of Xinjiang reporting. That uh, kind of connects to a couple of the questions that have come through from our students, uh, which is about the questions relate to the safety of the individuals that Ben, you interviewed. Um, can you comment a little bit more about, um, there's one question about, have you, do you know about people who've tried to escape these camps and yeah. seek asylum? Um, yeah. Could some of the Uyghurs that you interviewed be persecuted by the Chinese government yeah. are they protected in some way and then sure. generally like just the precautions that you take over mitigating risks for yourself for your interviewees for crew what what could you talk a little bit more about that 
Definitely. Um, these are all great questions. Some of them, I, I'm going to start, Sam, just because I think I can knock out some of them pretty quickly, and then you can feel free to chime in. Um, so I, I'm not aware of anyone ever escaping from a detention camp. Um, the security is is just extremely tight and um there's very you're, you're never alone there's there's very little opportunity for, for something like that there there this this simply the opportunity i believe does not exist however people are released from 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 the camps and um in 2019 quite a lot of people were released some of them were placed under house arrest some of them were sent to work in factories under what is probably coerced and unfree labor conditions um some of them were sentenced uh, either at the detention center or after two long prison terms, and they were transferred to a to a conventional prison. Which the, the construction of conventional prisons has also um, been part of this. What's happening in Xinjiang in the, the past few years and the the meteoric rise of of actual convictions of at, at criminal courts um, has also um, uh, I, I forget the exact figures, but there's something like 300,000 um, convictions between like 2017 and 2019, which is many fold more than in, in previous periods of that length. So, um, so yeah, although no one is, is being escaping from the camps, people are released into different conditions inside of Xinjiang, either before or after someone's detention, people do escape across the border into Kazakhstan. Um, and I've interviewed people who have done this and their situation is quite precarious. So in general, they don't wanna go on the record, um, but it, it does happen. Um, and, and Uyghurs in particular have also escaped to Turkey um, and to other countries in kind of the Turkic speaking world. Um, okay, so an another question was, could Uyghurs be, I interviewed, be persecuted by the Chinese government? Um, yeah, this is obviously a, a, a major concern for journalists working on this issue. I also want to note that it's not just Uyghurs who are the, the subjects of these, these measures. It's also ethnic Kazakhs in, in Xinjiang. And a lot of the people we interviewed for this project are ethnic Kazakhs. Um, and the situation is probably worse for Uyghurs um, than it is for Kazakhs for reasons that I go into in the article. Um, but I'll say that, yes, um, it is possible that that the people I interviewed or their family members, if they still have family members back in Xinjiang, could see repercussions. Um, and there's ways to mitigate that to a certain extent. Um, in some cases, you can change a person's name, but on the other hand, that, that significantly weakens the value of the testimony. Um, what I try to do is I try to lay out all of the risks and the very limited rewards that someone has by speaking to me and, and being published in a place like the Times or the New Yorker. And I try to make it clear that this probably won't get their family member freed from detention. Um, it will probably not mean that they can sue the Chinese government for a million dollars, as some people told me that they wanted to do, um, that really it's just contributing to a larger body of evidence and that their name would be public. And um, and we would have discussions about whether that was something they wanted to proceed with. And I would never push someone into that situation. And, and luckily, I suppose, um, there's a lot of people who are incensed and outraged about the, the situation of their for their family members and just their their um, their, you know, their their brothers and sisters in the larger sense who are living in Xinjiang, who want to go on the record and who, who believe that the risks are worth taking. Um, that said, I know people who have had to escape Kazakhstan because of their because of their activism or who have been arrested for for speaking out um, on this subject. So there are risks and there's there's ways to mitigate that, but you you can't eliminate it. Um, and I think that also addresses Natalie's questions. Um, I'm not aware of any family members of the people that I've that I've featured facing kind of direct retaliation, but definitely people who some of the more famous ex-detainees have said that their relatives have been put into detention um, after they after they spoke out about about their own detention or their own experiences with these detention tribes. Um, so it does happen. Um, and the risks to ourselves are um, pretty low compared to the risks faced by people who actually live in these countries. Like we, we take the usual precautions for reporting in an author authoritarian country. We're really careful about data security and stuff like that. But ultimately, the, the risks are um, the, the, really what you worry about if, if you're in a position like we are is, is the what's going to happen to the people you're talking to. Um, 
I will just add, since there were some questions about the language, the main operating language for a lot of our interviewees is Kazakh. Um, to a lesser extent, many speak some Chinese, um, but, and, and if they're Uyghur, they may speak Uyghur, but um, it depends on the level of education, what profession they're in. Definitely, we used a lot of, um, and, and, and I'll say that we used interpreters for these interviews, and, and that's another um, risk uh, population we have to worry about is what happens to the people who are assisting us on this project. A lot of them you'll see are credited as anonymous in the film because they, it's too dangerous for their names to be associated with the project, but they, they care very much about the project. In some cases, they're journalists themselves um, who are working in Central Asia. Um, in other cases, they have connections to Xinjiang themselves, so they know all of the relevant languages. Um, Chinese came up more often in terms of looking at like trial documents and other print materials from the Chinese government that we used in the in the both the film research and the and the article research. Um, but the interviews themselves were mostly conducted in Kazakh with an interpreter. Great. Uh, and there was another question kind of flipped. Um, how have you been able to translate this material into Kazakh or other or Chinese or other languages? Uh, how many other languages other than English is the is the material? In? Yeah. So the yeah, the, the film, as Sam pointed out, we were really adamant from the start with The New Yorker that we really, really wanted a Kazakh language version of this film because um, I think it is often the case that a reporter comes into a country, extracts really valuable journalism, and then that journalism never appears in a language that the, its subjects can even read um, or engage with, you know, much less have kind of an effect in that country. Um, and I've always been really dissatisfied with this, but it's, it's really hard to convince editors to pay for a translation, especially a translation into um, a language like Kazakh, which has a much, you know, you're not going to get as many clicks as with a Chinese translation. Um, so I was really thrilled that the New Yorker was willing to publish a Kazakh version of the film. Um, of course, all of the interviews are originally in Kazakh. So even if you listen to the, the English language version of the film, you can hear the Kazakh in the background, but we had, we had Kazakh voice actors do English language overdubs of, of all of the spoken Kazakh. Um, but you can still hear the Kazakh in the film. And then there's a Kazakh only version of the film in which we also translated all the text. Um, there's not a Chinese version of the article, but there is an unofficial one that some people that I have seen online, um, uh, which is accessible to people in the Chinese speaking world. And if anybody wants that later, they can email me or something I can say, but it has nothing to do with the New Yorker. And obviously has not been vetted for, for accuracy of translation, but um, there's been enough interest in, in having this available in, in Chinese that, that some people have taken it upon themselves to do it. Um, my New York Times Magazine article was, I think, translated into Chinese and, and different magazines have different um, sort of qualifications for what they think merits translation and whether they want to put it in, invest because you know then they have to fact check everything in that language it's, it is it is kind of a big process but like i said i think it's important um for kind of making this material available in the languages where it can make the most significant difference um so yeah that's a great question thank you um kind of uh, this is also a little bit uh, of a different um uh, take on this for Sam. We do have a lot of um, students in the audience. Uh, you may be aware that um, Duke has a Center for Documentary Studies, so we have a number of students who are doing the certificate and are interested in making documentary film. Could you, Sam, talk a little bit about your journey to this? What kind of training did you have? How did you start in documentary film? What What sort of brought you to these kinds of subjects as a documentary filmmaker? Sure. Um, so I, uh, let's see, now I have to think. It's a hard question. I, uh, I, st I went to University of Michigan. Um, I actually studied uh, film. It was sort of a split thing between uh, history, criticism and practice. And then I also worked at my student newspaper for four years and did the became photo editor and all of this stuff. And after school, I basically just jumped into um, working as a freelancer. And so um, for years, I would do a lot of contract work for different magazines and newspapers, which is a lot of assignment stuff. It's not always glamorous or stuff you, you, you love or care about, but I would always have things I was really passionate about on the side 
um, that would really drive me into my next, my next thing. And eventually I was able to um, sort of fully transition into taking on, you know, I don't know, I've been doing this, working in this field for eight, eight, 10 years now. So um, I've been able to sort of fully transition into taking on just these really big ambitious projects and waiting for the next one or working on the next one. Um, but it took a long time to sort of, um, you know, figure out how to go from, from that hustle of sort of a freelancer um, to, to working on, you know, something that takes a year with the New Yorker and, and or National Geographic or something like that. Um, and uh, yeah, and I'm sure Ben, Ben has a more unusual journey, I think, because you came from creative writing, I think, right? Well, I, uh, I have always been in journalism in some way. When I was in college, I spent summers working for my local town newspaper. Um, and uh, I was a science writer briefly after college. But uh, yeah, I did my, my higher education. I mean, my MFA is in fiction writing. I, I went to the I went to a writing workshop. Um, so I have a creative degree and, and yeah, kind of approach nonfiction from a kind of a creative nonfiction standpoint, one that intersects with my interest in journalism, but I did not go to journalism school. Um, but I somehow found myself very interested in, in how these kind of long form magazine narratives come together. Um, and, and also energized by the idea of doing work that, that matters and that can kind of, um, kind of amplify voices that are marginalized or that, or that rarely um, get a fair hearing in the, in the places that they're, that they're based. Um, yeah, that's, so that's my background. Great. Thank you. Um, let me uh, go to a question from Alexander, actually two questions from Alexander, uh, who asks uh, for, for you both to talk more about your sources and their validity. Uh, and just to read the question, he says, it's difficult to trust either American or Chinese news claims. The Chinese media is highly influenced by the state, but the American news is also influenced by the state and the recent narrative of the PRC as the enemy. Uh, and and Alexander's also asking uh, kind of a follow-up question, why would you not make a Chinese version when ch people in China need to know this information and the Kazakhs already know? Uh, yeah. Well, okay. Yeah. Let me, I'll, I'll take, I'll try to answer both of those. And then um, Sam, if you want to chime in as well. Yeah, that's go for fun. it. Yeah. So the, it, it's a great question about the validity of sources because it's something as a journalist, you have to um, really think about. And, and I think um, there have been uh, cases in the past. I heard one editor describe this as the North Korea problem where you have a really inaccessible environment um, and somebody comes out with a really bombastic story about their their experience in a labor camp or in a prison in North Korea, and then it it turns out that some of the details had to have been fabricated, and it um and uh, it, it kind of craters people's faith in this kind of uh, foreign reporting, um, and it does a great disservice to people who are who are trying to um, tell their uh, to, you know describe what actually happened to them and describe real lived atrocities in 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 an authoritarian country. Um, I will say the, the preponderance of evidence for the, for the reporting that I do is extremely high. And I, I actually shy away from um, accounts or pieces of information from Xinjiang that feel um, extreme or that feel too good to be true or that cannot be verified through other accounts. Um, and that was one aim of my oral history project was that to show that there are dozens of um, eyewitness testimonies and they are just so cross corroborative um, and they come, they live in different countries. They live in different parts. For those who live in Kazakhstan, they live in different villages across Kazakhstan. They include painters and doctors and farmers and unemployed people who are basically homeless. Um, it crosses kind of, you know, the people that I interview cross all social strata um, and backgrounds and even ethnic backgrounds. Um, and so I, I consider, I, you know, I have a very high bar for, for um, work that I think is is credible enough to use in my reporting. Um, I think a lot of journalists working in this uh, region feel that way and also are, are, you know, I think 
the the really a flight material like the New York Times or um, or BuzzFeed, um, they, they take that kind of um, corroboration very seriously and are really cognizant of the fact that this is like a hot button issue. And indeed, there's a lot of U.S. propaganda about a new Cold War with China that I I find really pukesome personally. Um, and I do think it results in a lot of really bad um, commentary on on human rights in China and a lot of um, policy proposals that I would not personally agree with. Not that, not that people usually ask me because I'm a journalist. Um, but I think that's all the more reason for really sober, careful works of journalism like this. And I think one of the, when, when we brought this material to the New Yorker, one of the claims we were making is that nobody had yet found such a well um, corroborated experience of a detention center where you had three men who were in the same camp at the same time. And we could verify their stories by various other kinds of information that we had up to and including satellite imagery that, that showed changes to the camp over time that tracked with the material that we were getting from the interview. Um, so yeah, I, I don't think anyone should trust either American or Chinese news claims on their face, but I do think you should look at the preponderance of evidence. Um, I think you should look at, I mean, I've long said that the, the best source of information for what's happening in Xinjiang is Chinese government documents. Uh, they describe, you know, t- until it became a major international news story, these documents describe changes in populations that were driven by um, mass incarceration, forced sterilization, forced birth control, coerced mixed marriages between Han men and um, Turkic and Muslim women. Um, All of these things are openly described in Chinese government documents and are just there for the viewing. Um, So you do not have to rely on any single person's extreme testimony um, in order to validate a lot of the claims that get made. And and this is something that I go into much greater detail in, in in my, in the, in the article that we put together and just very briefly to, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Uh, oh, just, just, just on that point, I think it's, um, you know, and it's an interesting thing making this type of work because obviously we're aware of the public discourse when you're making this kind of project, you know, but, you know, you can't, you know, we're not making this for any anyone's agenda and we stand behind our reporting and that's sort of where it stops, you know, we're not, trying to fit this into any any sort of larger narrative for either for anyone's you know bigger uh, a- agenda but inevitably people use use your work for whatever they see fit to do with yeah. it but that's just the nature of the beast it doesn't mean you you stop reporting on human rights abuses because somebody else is going to say well it means these people are evil you know um, it's sort of a, it's sort of a catch-22 in some ways but yeah yeah, and I, I mean, I've reported from many countries on many human rights and citizenship issues, and no one has ever questioned the validity of an interview I conducted until um, I started reporting on Xinjiang. And it's obviously because there is a ton of disinformation. I mean, there's a there's a huge disinformation campaign originating with the Chinese government to delegitimize eyewitnesses. Um, and it includes saying that they're... Um, that, that women who undergo forced sterilization were too promiscuous, like uh, stuff like that. Um, so it's hard to, you know, kind of like wade through all of this crap. Um, but indeed, like we're, this isn't a piece of commentary that we've made. It is a documentary. It is, it is rooted in these eyewitness testimonies. Um, my article does not make any policy proposals. It does not go so far as to describe what's happening in Xinjiang as crimes against humanity or or genocide, although it may quote groups that make those claims. It's similarly, you know, in turn, it quotes the Chinese government um, in in saying that that's not the case. Uh, We do strive for uh, conveying the objective reality of of the situation. Um, And if there's a claim that doesn't feel like we can substantiate it to our and to the New Yorkers satisfaction. We, it's not included in the reporting. And I just wanted to address your other question about the uh, Chinese version. I would love for there to be a Chinese version of the article. I wish there were, um, there is one, like I said, an unofficial one that my Chinese speaking 
contact say is very good. Um, but um, it was kind of a timing issue and also probably like a cost and effort issue for the publication. It's um, I think much rarer for the New Yorker to translate an article than it is for a place like the Times Magazine. Um, I think if, if it were at a newspaper, probably like that, it probably would have been translated, but this stuff is kind of above our pay grade and happens at the level of, of um, the, the web editors. Um, but I agree that uh, Chinese, um, Chinese speakers should, should have access to articles like this. I don't think it's the case that Kazakhs necessarily already know this material. I think um, I do think that having this 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 um, film out there was um, quite valuable, and we did a bunch of interviews in Kazakhstan on, on like Kazakh morning TV shows, even to talk about the film. Um, well, th that's something that you know I think uh, even being foreigners coming into a place and doing this reporting in Kazakhstan is meaningful in a way that local journalists can't do a lot of the things that we were doing at, for, for their own safety. So, so, you know, the local media is restricted in reporting on this and, you know, being, you do have that privilege as an outsider to come in and do things that you couldn't do as a local journalist. So, um, so yeah, I would agree that this is, you know, it's not a, it's not, it, it is meaningful to have this in, in, in Kazakh as well. Um, another question kind of coming out of uh, what you were both saying is uh, you both have reported on a number of different things. And I wonder if there was anything kind of a two part question, if there was anything particularly special or moving about about this particular project and and kind of a meta question, you know, uh, and I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about this. This is not cheap. I imagine to do this kind of work in both in time and treasure, and um, but you you know and I appreciate Sam you were talking about like picking the right subject for this approach is really important. Who is this for? You know, in our media saturated environment, who is kind of your ideal um, audience? So it's kind of a two part question, like. Um, your own sense of the importance of this in your life, like as a reporting uh, uh, project that you spent both spent a lot of time on, and who do you see as really the why? Why do you do this? Either one can take that one. <laughs> I think we were both waiting for the other to yeah. start. Um, I will say that what drives me to do a project like this is the idea of contributing um, not only. Uh, journalistically valuable information, information that makes um, a general audience in a place like the United States more informed, better citizens, perhaps, uh, better global citizens, but they can also potentially um, contribute in some small way to, um, you know, changing, uh, changing the situation and, and through raising awareness and depicting the reality on the ground, making it possible for that reality to um, to change and, and to you know kind of have that information be available to people, whether they're activists or politicians or or, or college students. Um, so that's kind of one half of it for me. And then the other half is I'm a writer and I'm interested in narrative. And I'm interested in ways in which um, narrative can be brought to bear on different um, kinds of realities in the world. And um, I think there's a lot of people who are just not that interested in news and who, even if they are interested in news, are kind of numbed to um, events. And I think it is incumbent on writers and artists to, um, you know, shine, a, to, to kind of raise a kind of mirror to events, but to do so in such a way that they are reflected anew on people who maybe think that they they aren't interested in the subject or that they don't need this kind of information that they have enough problems in their own lives. Um, I think that is what differentiates, um, you know, pure reporting from something like this, that is, that might be multimedia or might just be kind of like narratively experimental or narratively invested. Um, I think most of my writing is this kind of magazine writing that considers itself stylish or that aspires to qualities of literature and in, in, in the way in which it, it treats the world um, and treats kind of the psychology of its characters. 
so for me, that's kind of one thing that, that drives me um, no matter what I'm reporting on. And then um, a story like Xinjiang uh, just has felt so urgent. Um, and the, the stories that we kind of hear from it, from it so despairing that one is kind of compelled to um, try to make these stories available. But I would say that I think for both Sam and me, we did have like one ideal audience we had in mind was these three men who were in this camp. Like, I think we were probably more worried about their reaction than anybody's. We wanted them to see the film and to see their reality kind of reflected back at them. Um, and because this was such a difficult, weird, unprecedented project for us, um, we were kind of happy and maybe even surprised to, to sort of been able to achieve that. Did they Wait, see it? Sorry. Sorry, Sam. Did yeah, they see it? They did. Ben, you should describe their responses. Yeah, yeah they did. Um, you know, when I, when I talk with them over WhatsApp, we have different modes of communication because some speak... Chinese, uh, Yerba Cat speaks fluent Chinese and he likes to write in Chinese and we do like Google Translate with each other. Um, Orenbeck does not really speak Chinese, so he's the hardest to communicate with. And then Amanjan actually speaks some English. You hear him speak a little English in the in the film because he's a he was a businessman and he kind of had a more um, he was a little more cosmopolitan than the, than the other two um, detainees. And Amanjan wrote me a series of messages and left me a series of voice messages rather in which he really was astonished by the film and said it really felt like we'd been there in this camp and that it really was kind of exactly what he had experienced. And it was it was probably the most gratifying part of this whole experience was having him kind of validate the, the amount of work that went into kind of recreating these spaces Um yeah, but no, we're really pleased that all, all three of them got to see the film. Yeah, and I, I think I think when you do something, you know, there, there's so many audiences that you reach that are unexpected as well. You know, I think for, for me, I speaking to a lot of um, family members of, of detainees after this came out and thinking about how the film impacted them sort of in both positive and negative ways of being maybe re-traumatized by seeing how their family members might be visualizing where their family members could be, um, but also making that a more tangible thing, you know? So we've had some really tough conversations with people who have, who have gone through that. Um, you know, I think though that, as I mentioned at the, when I was sort of doing my talk, we wanted to make this as accessible as possible, you know? Um, and a lot of times it feels like you're screaming into the void with topics like this, you know? So if we can use new tools, if we can make beautiful things that people want to engage with that have a sense of humanity to them, um, I think it, it, it brings in an audience that, that you might not expect. And we've really, been hearing from people all the way from you know teachers wanted, wanting to bring this into high schools to ex you know family members of detainees to you know sort of people across the spectrum and I think that's sort of in some ways a testament to you know the the, the various ways that you can engage with this and sort of the the empathetic approach that we took to representing these these stories um, I guess to to answer the other question. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, maybe I won't answer that one right now. Actually, <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah, I sorry, I'm, 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 uh, yeah. Let me skip that one for now. I wish I could give you a shot of espresso just to keep you awake. But, <laughs> um, well, let me finish with just a last question that you can answer. Or not, but uh, what are you all working on? What do you want to work on? What's What's next for you both? Um. I'm, uh, so a few different things. I'm taking a break from this particular subject. I have a couple articles, a couple other projects that I'm working on that I are too, kind of too early in the process to really talk about. But um, a lot of my work right now is um, contributing to a book project I'm working on. That's um, the tentative title right now is The Fugitive World. And it is about kind of communities that have been rendered fugitive by the state um, and uh, di different communities in different countries and kind of the ways in which um, 
sort of resistance and self-determination operate in an era of, of kind of resurgent authoritarian authoritarianism. Um, and certainly, you know, the Xinjiang is a, is a model case for, for a, a model case of, of kind of how dystopian the administrative um, and carceral state can become, but it's by, it's far from the only example. And um, yeah, I, I, so, so this reporting and a lot of my other reporting in, in different parts of the world are, are going to contribute to this book project. Um, I also do have a, another short, I forgot I had a book review on, on Xinjiang coming out that goes further into kind of links uh, between the United States and its war on terror policies and how those were um, quite influential on the Chinese government. So just kind of like trying at the end here to kind of expand beyond China particularly. Um, but these, these the, the way in which um, policies of kind of ethnic assimilation or persecution are um, fall under the umbrella of this kind of terror washing, this kind of counter terror measures is obviously not unique to China. And in fact, I would say that, um, you know, it was kind of pioneered in the early days of the war on terror by the United States and its allies. And um, exploring those connections is also um, something that's, that's interesting to me. And Sam? Uh, so, okay, I will answer the last question really, really briefly now. Uh, sorry. So, so just really briefly, I think, um, you know, projects that, projects that kind of bring together my interest in emerging, emerging technology and new tool sets with something that's really meaningful that feels like it can create an impact um, is sort of this, this synthesis that I look for in all the new work that, that, that I take on. Um, and it's really hard to find those projects, both in terms of financing, as, as you mentioned, um, but also in terms of things that are worth um, putting the effort into that come out um, in, a, in a meaningful way. Um, and uh, yeah, in terms of what I'm working on next, um, yeah, I'm uh, uh, taking it a little slower. I have a few projects um, in the background right now. Um, I'm really interested, you know, working in immersive media. I'm really interested in what the future of immersive media looks like right now. And I'm working on something that's sort of interrogating that and looking at the influence of like surveillance capitalism on virtual reality and how that's going to shape its relationship to us in the future, um, which I think is something to be really scared of <laughs> as Facebook sort of dominates this space and starts talking about metaverses. Um, so yeah, I have a few things. I, I can't really talk about any of them right now, but I, I have a few things I'm excited about and I'm kind of pushing along and slowly on the background. So great. Yeah. So the work continues. The um, work continues. And, and Ben, real quick, where's, where was your review posted that you mentioned? Oh, the book review. It'll it'll be out in Reason magazine, but okay. I, I don't know when at some okay. point. Um, okay. Well, let us know. And I just want to, um, we're right at seven o'clock. We had a, over 70 people on our webinar. I just wanted to let you know, very well attended. Um, we got to most of the questions, but um, I wanted to thank our audience in particular for, for coming. Um, this was something we were really looking forward to being able to present to you. Thank our guests, Sam and Ben, for especially Sam for being up so late <laughs> and um, for hanging out with us for a little bit and um, being so willing to kind of go after some of those great questions. We're already getting some of our audience members thanking you. And, um, and thanks also to Emily for putting this together and as usual doing a flawless uh, webinar, except when the rest of us screw it up. So um, <laughs> um, thank you so much to everyone. Have a great night. And uh, Ben and Sam, we hope to be in touch with you soon again. Thank you very much. Thank you for having Thank us. You. We appreciate it.